You're listening to the InfoSec and Olsen Show. I'm your host, Joshua Mishav. Our guest this week is Ryan Dewurst. Ryan is probably best known for WPScan, which is a WordPress vulnerability database and scanner. And I imagine anyone who's run a pen test against WordPress has probably used it before. My three main takeaways from our conversation were one, common mistakes he sees when people run WPScan, two, three things you can do to stop 90% of WordPress attacks, and three, his tips on launching a security tool. You'll enjoy those two things, plus a bunch of other tips along the way. And with that, here's Ryan. So how did you get started with WordPress? Yeah, so um, I have my own WordPress blog. I was blogging about uh, things that I was learning at university at the time. And um, I was just at the very beginning of my pen testing career or web application security testing career. And I wanted to share what I was learning and, and my opinions and that kind of thing. Uh, so yes, yeah, so I started my own blog. Uh, and for whatever reason, I chose uh, uh, WordPress. I think it's, it's the most popular option, so. <laughs> okay, and then how did WPScan come about? Yeah, so it came about, um, I saw, I can't remember the name of the person, but someone posted uh, a vulnerability or some, some kind of security issue on, I think it was a bug track mailing list, and it affected WordPress. And I wanted to see it affect if it affected my own WordPress site. So I created a proof of concepts for the issue. Uh, tested it against my own site. And then um, that's when the idea uh, evolved to create a tool around WordPress security testing. Because I, during my searching at that time, I couldn't find any tool that, that did what I needed. And I think it first started um, with simple password brute forcing. Uh, and then I extended the tool to stuff like uh, a lot of enumeration. So enumerating the WordPress version. Uh, and and any plugins installed. All right, and let's shift gears for a moment. You also have another project, uh, DVWA. What is that? Uh, Yeah, so DVWA, Damn Vulnerable Web Application. When I was starting university, I quickly realized that they weren't going to teach us web application security, which was where my my passion was, really. So I decided uh, if I was going to learn how to do web application security, I I needed to teach myself. Uh, So I started to create demo or or sample vulnerabilities where I could code the the web application vulnerabilities such as cross-site scripting. And then I could learn how to exploit the vulnerability and then learn how to fix it too. And then once I started to put a few of these together, so I had cross-site scripting, SQL injection, and I could try manual SQL injection on there. I could try different automated tools to, to, to exploit SQL injection. Then I got like a, maybe five or six different vulnerabilities on these, uh, you know, separate pages. And I thought, well, it'd be great if I could put those, these all together in one web application and release it for, for others to do the same that I was doing, you know, practicing uh, web application security, testing your tools on there and that kind of thing. Um, so yes, I released that. We got a lot of, when, when I talk about DVWA and WP scan, um, it's never just me. There's always a lot of, uh, contributors who have helped over the years in, in various ways. So uh, with DVWA, I think we've had like maybe three to four major iterations. So I, I, I started with concepts uh, and I did the first iteration, but then after that, there's been people who have almost completely rewritten the thing uh, three or four times already. So I can't take the full credit for where these projects are now, but, um, but yeah, the DVWA was released and became uh, quite popular. Cool. So let's talk a bit about the Vuln database that you you run. How, how did it how did it start? Yeah, the vulnerability database. So when I first created WP Scan, one of the very first features was to detect what plugins were installed on a WordPress website from a black box perspective. So from an outsider's perspective, and then I thought, and then there was all these plugin vulnerabilities all around the internet, like people were blogging about them or, or tweeting about uh, WordPress plugin vulnerabilities. And there was no real central place. Obviously, there are other vulnerability databases like OSVDB. Is that still around? Uh, no, yeah, I was just thinking that. <laughs> that's not around anymore. Still do a lot of data mongling for them back in the yeah. day. But uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, there, there, there are others. Uh, Exploit DB, for example, yeah. And there was no real centralized place. So we we started to collect and they weren't complete like these, they were cause they weren't concentrated on just WordPress vulnerabilities. They were missing quite a few of them at the time. Um, so I started to collect these, it's mostly plugin vulnerabilities, right? If, we, if we're talking about WordPress security, um, like 80 odd percent of vulnerabilities that affect WordPress are plugin vulnerabilities. So we started to collect these in XML files that we 
distributed with the WP scan source code. And then after say about a year, it started to become really unmanageable in XML files. Um, so there was a conference, there still is a conference in Brussels called Brucon, and they offer, or they did offer grants for attendees to give them uh, for their security projects. So I applied for that and they gave us a small, they gave us a small grant of 2000 euros to start a centralized web application repository where we could store our vulnerabilities, have a submission form like we do now and manage those vulnerabilities and distribute them such as through our API uh, in a better way. And since since we've done that, the vulnerability database has had to actually become more popular than our the tool itself. And that's what we currently monetize. That's how we, the WP scan now is a business and has been for the past couple of years. And that's how we, um, that's how we make our income is through the vulnerability database. So how useful has crowdsourcing been to, to collect vulnerability data? Like FOSS tends to have like a few submissions, like a few main contributors and how have you been finding uh, crowdsourcing? Yeah. So for the WP scan, WP scan software itself, contributors, we haven't had that many source code contributors or the ones who did contribute significantly are now my partners in the business. The people who, um, for example, Erwan, who works uh, at WP scan with me, he rewrote the tool. I think it's like the second time he's completely rewritten it now from my original code. So yeah, so obviously he was a very significant contributor and now he's a my partner and he works with me at the WP scan full time. But yeah, vulnerability submissions at first, it was quite slow, but over the past couple of years, it has ramped up and we are, we are putting a lot of effort into attracting submissions now as well. How, how do you do that? Yeah. So we, we give away, we give away monthly prizes, um, or giveaways, for example, uh, Amazon vouchers. So we, we, so we get, I don't know the exact number. I've not looked into it, how many submissions we get per month. Um, but if I pick a number right there, so like. 20 different people submit to us each month. And then we'll pick one of those randomly each month and award them a prize. So that may be um, some WP scan swag, like a, a branded jumper, a sweater. We give a 50 euro Amazon vouchers away. And our biggest giveaway to date will be on our 10th birthday on June 16th. We'll be giving away a OSCP uh, offensive security certification uh, to a submitter who submits a vulnerability to us uh, this year. And yeah, we, we, that's how we, because obviously they're, they're submitting this data to us that we're then charging other people to consume. So um, we like to give back not only for uh, to say thank you for the submission, but also to contribute back to the community as well. And what kind of process do you have in place to verify the vulnerability is real? Yeah, so the submissions we get usually, I mean, we get most of the submissions we get are real vulnerabilities. Where we find most fake ones are on other vulnerability databases that may not verify their submissions. So yeah, so in the past few years, and at the beginning, we didn't verify every vulnerability because we weren't working on the project full time. I only started on the project last October full time. Um, so before that, every vulnerability may not have been manually verified, but it was you know, checked visually or to make sure it made sense technically. But yeah, since October, every vulnerability that enters our database is, is manually checked through a, creating a proof of concept. And yeah, sometimes we do get fake ones that come in, but it's quite rare to get those submitted. So the, most of the time, the ones that get submitted, the, 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 the not valid vulnerabilities are just uh, the researcher doesn't understand WordPress's security ecosystem for example, an administrative user in WordPress is allowed to inject JavaScript into to comments or into pages or into posts. That's just the, the security model of WordPress. So we get a lot of researchers who think they find cross-site scripting in WordPress and it's, it's just that they've been authenticated as an administrator when they try to exploit that. So yes, there's a misconception there. And yeah, and then other times there are vulnerabilities which are like, so a lot of WordPress plugins, a feature is to allow their users to embed JavaScript on their front pages. So for example, a plugin may allow you to add Google Analytics to your front pages. So that obviously needs to allow JavaScript to be submitted and, and entered into a page. And we may get a, a, a scooter researcher submitting that to us and saying, hey, I find a way to inject JavaScript in this plugin. 
But then we speak to the plugin author and the author's like, yeah, that's, that's the point of the, that's the whole point of the plugin. So, so there's those kind of, uh, situations that you got to go back to the security researcher and say, I'm sorry, but the author doesn't believe this is a vulnerability. And yeah. And it sometimes it takes, it does take a lot of time. Sometimes we may have vulnerabilities in our backlog for maybe, you know, two, three weeks while we're talking to the author of the plugin, we're talking to the security researcher and we're also talking to uh, WordPress themselves. We have, we're, we're in touch with the WordPress uh, plugins team, like on a daily basis. We, on average, I'd say we get between two and three, we add two, between two and three vulnerabilities to our database per day. And so, yeah, we're, we're talking to WordPress about those um, on a daily basis. Well, so how do you track, let's say WordPress plugin vulnerabilities? Is it like Google dorks or what, what's, how do, how do you stay abreast about what, what, what vulnerabilities are new? Yeah, so we have, a lot of different ways. Some ways I, I can't really talk about because we have uh, we have uh, uh, competitors who um, who, who uh, would, would give them an advantage. We have some sneaky ways to find vulnerabilities. Um, but yeah, no, we have, we have so we have the submissions, so we get them submitted directly to us. A lot of vulnerabilities we find ourselves. So, for example, um, if we if a, a security researcher submits a vulnerability to us, and then we will. While we're verifying that vulnerability, we often see other vulnerabilities affecting the, the plugin. So we, we find a lot of additional vulnerabilities that way. We have searches across the web, as you suggested. So we, we do Twitter searches using keywords. We have, uh, we use various services that allow you to be notified when certain keywords are, are spoken about online, such as on Reddit or on blog posts and that kind of thing. We have a, a bunch of honeypots set up around the web, WordPress honeypots. Uh, so we uh, are looking out for zero days being exploited and we have found a handful of, of zero days being exploited um, in the past. And then we add them to our database. And yeah, we have we have some internal stuff. As I said, I can't really give too many details on that right now because some of it is still a work in progress. But yeah, we have some very cool internal stuff going on as well, which uh, first I can't, <laughs> can't mention right now. All right. Are there like common mistakes you see when people use a WP scan? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Actually, there is, there is one. The most common mistake is really I see it as a, as a, a problem with WP scan, more of a a user mistake. We are going to correct that soon. And that mistake is the plugin enumeration. So in, in WP scan, you've got, um, three different enumeration options, which is passive, aggressive, or mixed passive enumeration. So we're trying to make them as the minimum amount of HTTP requests as possible to, to the WordPress website to be as stealthy as possible. Aggressive is like, yeah, I just don't care how many HTTP requests we send. I just want as much data as possible. Obviously that's loud. And if you're pen testing, that's going to get you, um, or bug bounty hunting, that's going to get you noticed. And mixed is like a nice mixture of both of those. So by default, all, all enumeration options are mixed except for plugin enumeration, which is passive. So a lot of users will do a plugin enumeration and see that actually they didn't get many plugins returned or as many as they thought they would. And that's because they haven't explicitly set plugin enumeration to be aggressive. And when they do that, they'll get a, a more complete list of, of plugins that are installed. But we we are going to change that behavior quite soon, hopefully in the next few weeks or months, so that you don't have to explicitly set plugin enumeration to aggressive and it will be mixed like all the other enumeration options. Uh, and that's just an artifact that got implemented uh, through a couple of rewrites. And um, over time, we've noticed that, yeah, users are constantly being tripped up by that. Um, it is mentioned quite a lot in the documentation, but you know, who reads, who reads the documentation? <laughs> so, so yeah, we're going to make that change um, soon. Hopefully. Now, assuming you're doing like an authorized pen test, is, the reason, is there any reason not to run in aggressive mode? Yeah. So the worst thing when you're a pen tester, what can happen is um, you're testing a really old server with a really old WordPress installation. It's not been looked at for years. Uh, and even if you, you know, if, if you, if you look at it the wrong way, it just falls over backwards and then the website's down and then you're getting the phone call from your boss saying, Hey, the website's down. What's going on? The client's not happy. That kind of thing. So yeah. So if you believe it's that type of website, like if it's really old, you, you think there might be a chance that it can't handle a, a large number of requests in quick succession, then yes, I would definitely do the passive option. I'd say it was, 
it would probably always be safe to start off with that. Go, you know, start off uh, passively and then ramp that up to aggressive. There's also, we have one option, which is called uh, Stealthy, uh, which is literally like, I think it might be maximum three HTTP requests in, in the Stealthy mode. And we can give you a whole bunch of information in just three HTTP requests regarding that WordPress site. So it really is Stealthy and it uses like random user agent strings and that kind of thing. So, so yeah. Interesting. What, what's the most underrated feature? Mm, most underrated feature. So there's a lot of stuff that we do in the background, which is probably people aren't aware of. So we do a lot of clever stuff. I and mean, the, the tool has been around, will have been around 10 years on June, June 16th this year. So during that time, there's, there's a lot of clever stuff that we do in the background that we may not have blogged about or, or it may not be documented properly. So yes, yeah, so there's a couple of those things. So there was a older version of WordPress. I, I checked recently, it doesn't affect the latest version, but I don't know what version it stopped in. So uh, XML, uh, the XML RPC interface, which is like the old API for WordPress, used to allow you to send multiple authentication attempts in one HTTP request. So you could send like uh you could send 500 password attempts in one HTTP request, and that's going to speed up your your HTTP, your password boot forcing by like 500 times. So that's not well documented, and not a lot of users know about that. And if it is that WordPress version that is affected by that, you much more likely to to brute force a a, a, a password that way. Another thing that WP Scan will do is will automatically choose whether to do the XML RPC brute forcing or to brute force the uh, WP login.php page. And it will automatically decide for you which it thinks will be the, the best based way. Based on? Um, based on whether XML RPC is enabled or not, basically. The WP uh, login.php page usually has like, well, it can have capture or rate limiting applied, whereas the XML RPC interface is less likely to have that those kind of protections on there. Um, so yeah, that's some of the clever stuff that we do. Also with um, plugin and theme version enumeration and even WordPress version enumeration, uh, what we do is we check for client side files. So if a JavaScript file was changed within a plug with within two versions of a plugin, we we record that and we can we can detect the version of that plugin based on that change in that JavaScript file. Um, so that's something clever that we do. And that that's also like a database that we that we generate and we update on a regular basis. So if it's not obvious what version of the plugins installed, if the person running the WordPress website has tried to hide that somehow, we still have a good chance of detecting that that WordPress the plugin that's installed the version number. Cool. So from a defender perspective, what changes do you recommend people do to I don't say break WP scan, but how can they help protect their websites from perhaps unauthorized scans? So how to prevent WP scan? Uh, I mean, is it as simple as like looking for user agent string unless somebody changes that? request velocity yeah so i mean the yeah the first thing the obvious thing would be to check the, the user agent thing for the wp scan uh, keyword um but yeah that's yeah it can easily be changed we have a um you can use a random user agent strings um for that how else could you prevent wp scan yeah i mean you could look you, you could implement like rate limiting so when we do plugin enumeration so if you see that the wp content forward slash plugins directory directory has been called like more than like once a second or whatever you can you can probably detect that and and, and then and block that so yeah like standard rate limiting would, would definitely work i think wordpress um so now we're looking at instead of how to prevent the wp scan like how to protect wordpress itself and there's a lot of very good wordpress uh, security plugins that you can install third-party security plugins um, we have a cl close relationship with uh, wordfence uh, which is the the most popular uh, security plugin available, and it does a very good job at protecting WordPress uh, itself. I'm not sure if it actually prevents WP Scan from being used against the site. I'll have to check that out, but it certainly does make your WordPress website much more secure. It does that, for example, by adding rate limiting or capture to the login page, uh, detecting if there's plugin enumeration going on, detecting if the things aren't updated. It also has a a, a WAF, uh, WordPress specific web application firewall as well in, in WordFence. So, um, so yeah, I definitely recommend installing that security plugin if, if you don't already have it installed. Would you recommend removing like uh, readme files and stuff to help prevent the plugin enumeration? Um, 
No, yeah, as, as I said, yeah, we can, we can do that anyway through the client side files. So in older versions of WordPress, the readme.html file would expose the version, num- the version of WordPress installed. Then they, they removed the exact version and made it the major version. And then in the most recent versions of WordPress, they, it doesn't give the version number away at all within the, in the readme.html file. So yeah, th- there's no point. Well, and talk a little bit about for plugins, like each plugin has a readme.txt file. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could, yeah, you could remove it, I guess, but yeah, we we can still you can still enumerate it. Anyway. Yeah, we can still enumerate it. Yeah, I mean, that, that's actually not a, not a bad idea. You know, to stop like the base or just even to make it harder for 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 WP Scan, it, it could be possible to maybe write a, a a web server config rule to anyone trying to read a readme.txt files just uh, just block those requests. But yeah, no, it's a good idea. Actually, I might, I might give that a try and just see how, see how WP Scan reacts to that. All right. So recently, WP Scan not so recently became a CNA, and you can assign a CV numbers. How did that come about? Yeah, the, the, I was invited to Google. Have a for the past couple of years, they have a CMS Security Summit, uh, so a Content Management Systems um, Security Summit, which is invite only. And uh, last year they had it in. Um, the year before they had it in Germany. I get mixed up what years now with COVID. <laughs> the years also blurred to one. So yeah, so, so I was invited there a few years ago and it was all the heads of the different uh, CMSs, such as uh, Joomla, uh, Drupal, that kind of thing, were, were all there. And yeah, they, 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 they talked a lot about CNAs and becoming a lot different people there were, were talking about the potential potentially becoming CNA. So I think Joomla now is a CNA. And yeah, it just gave me the idea, like, why, yeah, why don't we give it a try? And yeah, we went through the process. So it, it's quite rigorous. We have to, well, first you get questioned. So yeah, you're like, you're, it's like an interview style question, just to make sure that you're technically, you know, that you're able to assign CVE numbers, you're able to identify a vulnerability and different vulnerabilities. So you can have one piece of code, which can have multiple CVE numbers. It can have multiple vulnerabilities there. Um, So yeah, so first is an interview interview panel, then you get some homework to do. And then, yeah, then you define your scope if there's no one else doing your specific area. So our, we're exclusive, we can only assign CVE numbers to WordPress core plugins or themes. We can't assign CVE numbers to just any old software. And then, yeah, and then uh, hopefully they accept your application and and you can start. Oh, then yeah, yeah, you have to obviously ask for your your CVE uh, block. They give you a block of numbers to, you can then give out. And then they monitor you actually. I don't know if you know about this, but they, 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 they monitor your quality. I think it's on a monthly basis. Um, so ensuring that you're not making too many mistakes. I don't know what the consequences are if you do. We're not, we're, we're so far we've been, we've been quite good. But yeah, you get a report like every month saying, you know, how, how well you're, or how many mistakes you're making or how many retractions you've had and that kind of thing. We haven't had any yet. Yeah, I think we're doing okay. But yeah, they do, they do monitor that stuff and make sure the quality is, is, is correct. Or even just submitting them actually was the first time was quite hard trying to get the expected data in the correct JSON field that they required. So yeah, so just trying to meet their expectations on that first submission was was quite difficult. It took us like four or five times to get that right the first time. And now we're submitting them, you know, without issues. But, but yeah, they are, they are stricter than I thought they would be. <laughs> but yeah, I guess that's a good thing. I guess that's good, yeah. Yeah. It's, how did you, with WP Scan, what, what brought you, you made a licensing change and, and now it's like there's a commercial offering. How did that come about? Yeah, so WP Scan, the very first uh, version of WP Scan was open source. And then we realized that a lot of businesses were t- taking the code and reselling it, commercializing it, and not contributing anything back. So basically, we were, at this time, we're do- I'm doing this in my free time around, around my day job. So I realized I was working for these big corporations for free, basically, <laughs> and they were making profit from, from my work. And they'd even come, you know, like feature requests or come a bit, or come and open an issue being really snarky and pissed off that we weren't supporting the latest version of Ruby just because we hadn't had the time to get right to it. And it's like, you know, they're making money from this. And um, so, so yeah, and there was, so there was that. And then I quickly realized that open, so I tried to prevent that and then quickly realized that open source, you can't prevent that with open source software. By the very nature of open source, it allows commercialization. Well, that's my understanding. Anyway, I'm not a, I'm not a lawyer, but that was my understanding at the time. So we said, okay, let's do our own license and we'll call it, uh, we'll do a public, public source license. That means that the source code is public, um, but it's not open source software. 
So it's a public source license and it basically allows you to use it for free in uh, as long as it's non -co non-commercial. And if it is commercial, you need to contact us and we will sell you a, a commercial license. And then we quickly find out that many, many businesses were still using it commercially, just ignoring the license. Some, some businesses did, you know, come forward and say, yeah, we're using this commercially. What's the cost? And they did pay us and that was great. Um, but yeah, it wasn't a, it wasn't making enough money to make it a viable business. So I got to the point, I was at a word camp, um, in Berlin a few years ago, and I, I was just so surprised at how many people that actually knew what do scan was. And I, I spoke to a few different business owners and they were, they were shocked that we weren't monetizing it in a better way. And it kind of made me feel a bit, a bit stupid for not, for not taking advantage of that. And it got to the point where it got so much work. We're like, well, we either abandoned the project or we, we tried to, you know, take this seriously and finally, make, you know, it'd been like 80 years at this point. So we've been working on this. So try and finally make it into a real profitable, viable business and see how far we can take this. So when we got to that point, we thought the best way to do that would be to commercialize the vulnerability data. So the WP scan software still works as, as normal, but if you want the vulnerability data that might affect a WordPress plugin version, uh, you have to pay a small fee for that. We do give away, we do have a free plan. So most people can use a free plan, uh, but we also have paid plans for the vulnerability data. And since we commercialized the vulnerability database, that's when we've started to earn enough revenue to, well, to employ myself full-time and um, Erwan full-time and really, for example, reinvest in the community by, get, by giving away these giveaways to, to, the, to the security community. And yeah, now it feels like a, like a real business, whereas before it may have just been a project. And I think we've got that balance right, right? We, people can still use WP scan, brute forcing, plugin enumeration, theme enumeration. Everything works except for... If a plugin is vulnerable to a specific vulnerability, you need that API token to talk to our vulnerability database. And we do have a free plan, which works like most of the time for, for, for if you're scanning one website, the free plan will, will be fine. Do you, do you have any advice for someone who, based on your experiences, wants to launch a security tool? What would you tell them? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, WP Scan and DVWA were released, you know, like 10 years ago now, and uh, both became very popular unexpectedly. They started off as very small projects and they became very popular very quickly. And you do get, if that does happen, you do get burdened with, um, as I said, users start to have expectations. Why doesn't this work? Why isn't this updated? Why am my pull request been pulled? And people get very angry and very quite nasty. And you're doing the, this person, you know, the person who created the security tool is volunteering. If, if you hadn't done that work in the first place, you wouldn't have the tool to use in the first place. And no one's, very few people actually uh, give you say thank you for the tool and very few people appreciate the work that you've done most people who you i mean they probably do appreciate it but you never hear that right you always hear the, the bad stuff so yes yeah, so i'm probably a lot cynical more cynical now than i was 10 years ago and that's if i was releasing a security tool now i, I would think about commercialization from from, from the offset maybe make that give away something for free, give some value away for free, but also maybe have a, a commercial part just to make it worth your time to do that. I, I would also reconsider using an open source license. I know that's kind of sacrilege in, uh, in some parts, but, but yeah, be careful if, if really think about the licensing, of, uh, if you're releasing a tool, because once you release as open, as open source, it's very difficult to change that. That code that you released as open source is always going to be open source. So if you can take a version now of WP scan that was open source, say six years ago, and that piece of code is still open source. Like you, you can, you still have the open source rights to that code that was released six years ago. And now there's no way to take that back. And yeah, be aware that it allows commercialization. So others can take your code and make money from it. And they don't have to give anything back. I mean, if, if you read the open source license, they probably do have to give their, their modifications back, but in reality, no one does, like it never happens. So yeah, so maybe don't be too eager to assign an open source license at first, maybe see how the project goes and, and think about commercialization. I mean, it's your work, it's, it's your time, you know, you should be compensated for that. If it's something novel that people are using, you know, I think, I think it should, you should, you should definitely be compensated. Uh, and if, if you do do it for free, that's, that's great, but it may come a time when it becomes, you know, a lot of work and a burden and you may wish 
have, you may wish that you had have uh, chose a different license or, or, or thought about monetizing it. But there are other great benefits as well. I don't want to be too cynical, um, such as, yeah, you get to, you get feedback from the community, your peers get to use something that you created and, and your peers usually, you know, they value for that. So th there is also benefits of, of releasing security tools as open source and freely available and that kind of thing. But yeah, it is, it is, I think it's a, a difficult decision and yeah, just be careful when you, when you do that. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Do you have any advice for keeping WordPress secure beyond, beyond WordFence and the uh, WP scan uh, plugin? Yeah, so definitely the, I think the two major things really is keeping everything up to date, mainly your, your, your plugins, right? WordPress core does where the security release like a few days ago. So WordPress code is affected by, by security vulnerabilities now and then. Usually they're not that serious nowadays. They can be obviously, but usually they're not. So keep your WordPress version up to date, but more importantly, definitely your WordPress plugins. They're more likely to have, be affected by vulnerabilities and more likely to be affected by serious security vulnerability. Themes also, very rarely do we, do we have vulnerabilities in themes, but it does happen. So I do keep them updated as well. Passwords, so ensure that any administrator accounts, you know, keep those to a minimum. And um, those that you do have, ensure that they have secure passwords. You, then you can do stuff like adding two-factor authentication to your login page, locking XML RPC, that kind of thing. Um, but the two, oh, I'd say three major things that I would do is ensure that you dating everything, ensure that you have a secure password and install a security plugin. Th those three main things, if you do those, you're going to stop like 90% of attacks so, or even more. So, um, yeah. Awesome. All right, Ryan Deerhurst, thank you so much for your time. This has been great. Thank you very much. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks again for listening and for leaving reviews. And if you have any comments or questions, I'm at Jamoose on Twitter or drop me an email at podcast at breachsense.io. And if you're part of a security team that needs visibility into your clients, employees, or third-party suppliers' breach credentials before criminals exploit them, head on over to breachsense.io to apply for a free seven-day trial. And I'll be back in your earbuds next Thursday morning.